morning. Uh, welcome to Grand Rapids Evangelical Free Church. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Hutner. I'm one of the elders here. Um, if you're a guest with us today, a special welcome to you. Thanks for visiting. And uh, if you're watching online, uh, hello to you guys out there as well. A uh, couple of announcements. Uh, Sunday, May 5th, we have a new Faces Lunch. We do these from time to time. We've got so many new people coming into our church, and we really want to connect with you. Uh, this is a great opportunity, whether you've been coming for six months, or you've been here once, um, or if you just want to come and, and meet some new people. Um, we break bread, some elders and staff members will be there, and you can ask us questions about the church, and we can get to know each other better. Um, Wednesday, May 8th, uh, will be the, the kids group family night. A uh, really fun night, hopefully the weather will cooperate, and we can be outside playing games, um, having fun. Uh, May 6th, we have a blood drive. I encourage you guys to donate blood. And then quick announcement, uh, this Saturday, really big deal is the junior high Nerf war. So if you're in junior high, I uh, strongly encourage you guys to come out and shoot each other with Nerf bullets. Uh, let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we give this Sunday to you. Uh, we pray that your, your presence would be here, Lord. Uh, in a world that uh, seems to be more and more distracting with politics and war and sports and jobs and everything that we can fill our lives with besides you, Lord, I ask that uh, you would guide us back towards you and, and what's important. And the, the things in this world are fleeting. Our time on this world is short. And eternity with you, with you, Lord, and our relationship with you um, is what's most important. Lord, for those sick, I pray for healing. For those struggling with loss or loneliness, I pray for comfort and companionship. And just as Micah comes, uh, I pray that uh, his words would be yours, Lord, and that you would open our hearts to receive it and take it with us today as we go throughout the, the rest of the week. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Welcome to E Free. We're glad all of you are here today. If you're able, let's, uh, let's stand and praise together, shall we?
Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Micah Labovich. I'm lead pastor here at Grand Rapids Evangelical Free Church. So I want to welcome you in person and, of course, online, as always, here this morning. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Colossians 1. It's where we're going to be here this morning. And as you're turning to Colossians, um, I did just want to make another note uh, and just another plug for... So in a few weeks here, we do have, again, our quarterly business meeting. Uh, as has been said, we weren't able to vote on things... And have things go into our constitution uh, because we did not have enough of the membership attend uh, the last time. So we really do encourage you. Again, that's uh, the 23rd here. So not this Tuesday, but the Tuesday following. So please, if you are a member of our church, please mark that down. Make sure you're here at that meeting. Uh, we have, of course, several updates as well as, as church family business and so uh, as well as just really church family fellowship and the time to be the body together. So again, I just want to plug that. Please come on the 23rd. Mark that down so that that we can make sure that we have enough of the membership there to vote. Also, if you're not a member of our church, but you're interested in learning more about our church, again, a plug for on the 30th here this month. Uh, now, I know some of you, last week we actually heard some of you have taken the packets in the back about what it means to be a member at our church, uh, and you were overwhelmed by the size of it. <laughs> um, it's not meant to be overwhelming. In fact, actually, uh, one thing that we're uh, specifically doing, specifically Michelle is trying to do, is make that more of an online format, so it's going to be a whole lot easier. Uh, our hope and our desire is just to give you information, uh, really to begin to start a conversation as to who you are in Christ and who we are, and to see uh, that as a relationship where we commit to one another in a covenant of membership. And so, so with that, uh, we do encourage you. Uh, you don't have to, if you go to that class, not like you have to become a member, uh, but we do encourage you to learn more about our church uh, and attend that class there on the 30th. So since there was no interlude, I just wanted to have an interlude and give two more of those plugs uh, that we've already encouraged you, but I just want to encourage you all the more so. Now with that, please turn again to Colossians 1. And as we go to Colossians 1 again, last week we started our series here on Colossians. And we've titled this series, A Church Alive in Christ. And the reason for that is that, as we talked about last week, is that much of what Paul is doing and the Apostle Paul is doing here to the church, that is the, the body of believers in Colossae, is he is defining who they are as a church. And, and with that, last week our, our uh, title was actually Set Apart Together. Uh, this week we're talking about shareholders and the like. The reason for these kind of titles is, is we need to understand that for the majority of what the Apostle Paul is preaching and teaching here, alongside with Timothy, of course, is that he is talking to the church as a whole together. In our individualized American world, we oftentimes see this as, as a very specific, like, oh, this is just me, this is all about me, it's only me, this is just me. But really, remember, Paul is talking to everyone at the church. So when he's talking to the people at Colossae, as well as this letter that he knew would then be passed to other churches and eventually through history would find its way down to us by the grace and divine will of God, that we would hear this message together, that we would hear these messages together, right? That it's not just about you alone, but you're actually a part of this body, of this family. And we talked about last week, right, that Paul even says that. He says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, of the love that you have for all the saints, right? He talked about it's this love, it's this faith in Jesus that has worked itself out in loving the saints, right? And this doesn't mean that you're loving St. Peter or St. Christopher or St. whatever, right? This is the believers, right? Saints is just that fancy word for set apart ones, Holy ones. That's what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ, is that God has set you apart, and if you have faith in him, you will love the other Christians. You will love other ones, other set-apart ones, because of the mutual hope that you have together in Christ, in the heavens. Now, we talked about last week how all those things kind of work together together. And actually, uh, then Paul kind of takes this tangent and goes to the gospel and talks about the gospel spreading throughout the world. And we talked about the big church. We talked about the little church. But really, the reality is, even as Paul calls Timothy a brother in 1-1, we are faced with that we are, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a member of his family. Now, uh, when I think about family, I think about distinctives. Now, when, when you were growing up, and maybe, maybe you had this, maybe you still have this, I'm sure, I'm sure you do, every family has family distinctives, okay? And what I mean by that is the things that make your family uniquely you. 
For example, actually, when I was growing up, uh, we had our, our my, one of my best friends, uh, Tom. His family uh, was like his house was the hangout house. Like, like, like you guys all know that maybe your family was that house. Uh, maybe your family was not. My family was not that house. I'll talk about those distinctives in a little bit or the reasons why people didn't want to come to our house. But we went to other, I went to other people's houses. And so like my friend Tom, like his, like he and his dad and his parents, like his mom would bake and make crazy amounts of food. And it was this wonderful thing. And his dad made this huge patio where we would, you know, burn old Christmas trees and pallets and couches. I don't, rec- I don't recommend any of that. Uh, but if you do it, it's really cool. Just do it safe. Um, but, but so we would burn things and we would enjoy each other's company. And he had this tree house out in the woods and like, like his house like, that, that was their family distinctive. Like, Tom's house was the house we would go to. Uh, in my family, the distinctive was that we were loud. Okay, now that's going to come as a surprise because I'm so quiet and reserved. Um, but, like, we would, so, so when my wife uh, met me and, and we started dating, uh, we, I actually took her to a Perkins that no, sadly no longer exists, but I took her to a Perkins uh, that literally was, like, five minutes from my dad's house where he grew up. So we went to this Perkins that had existed for, like, over 40 years. And, and Kasha, my, my wife, of course, we were just dating at the time, we were sitting with my family. So, and not even my whole family, just my mom, my dad, my sister, myself. I think that was it. Uh, I have another brother another, and a sister who, who weren't there. But we were at this table in Perkins, and we happened to notice that by the end of the conversation, there was like this ring of absent tables all around us. Everyone else in the restaurant was sitting literally in the other section because we were so loud that if they had sat by us, they wouldn't be able to have their conversation. Now, we didn't care. We were having a great time. Uh, That's also a part of my family distinctive, Um, that we were just enjoying ourselves and having a grand old time, but that distinctive of that we were enjoying one another so much that actually made other people kind of feel awkward and that they had to go to another side. So, So the question is, what are your family distinctives. Now, every family has bad ones. Every family has good ones. But the bottom line is we have things that make us who we are, ways that you are known in your community. Hopefully, you even have this. Probably, you have this even today. Maybe your family is known for being the Fisher family, right? You guys are the guys, or, or you're the ladies who, who everybody in your family fishes. Everybody in your family, they, they basically sleep with their tackle boxes. Maybe your family is known as the ones who are always outdoors. Maybe your family are known as the ones who can build anything and make anything. Whatever your family is known as... It is a defining attribute of who you are as a people. Well, Paul here is trying to do that same thing with the Christians in Colossae, and really for all of us. He's trying to explain that who we are as believers in Jesus Christ ought to make you distinctive, so that when people meet you, when people know you, when people see you, they shouldn't just know your last name. They shouldn't even just know maybe your job or the things. They should know you are a part of the family of Christ. And if people know you and they don't know you're a Christian, something is wrong. And I would say this, I would argue that maybe you're not living out in the distinctives that make you who you are in the family. And again, I say in the family, not just individually by yourself, but together as the whole. So with that, please, let's jump in together and see what is Paul's earnest prayer for the distinctives that make the family of the body of Christ who we are. So with that, let's pray and join together in Colossians 1. So, <coughs> so God, we do thank you that you have made us who we are in you. And oftentimes, Jesus, we have an identity in you. We have distinctives in you that we don't live out well. Uh, for whatever reasons, Lord, often sometimes because of our own rebelliousness, sometimes because of our own uh, stubbornness, sometimes, Lord, it is just merely because of ignorance that we don't know. But, Lord, the reality is that we have been made a family in you, Jesus. You have transferred us. You have saved us. You have redeemed us, Lord. The list goes on and on of the things you have done for us. And so, Lord, my desperate prayer and plea is that anyone who doesn't know you would come to know you here this morning, that they would believe in you, they would put your trust, their trust in you, that they would follow you no matter what, Lord, for the rest of their lives. And that, Lord Jesus Christ, for we who do know you, that you would define us by who you are. And because of that, Lord, that you would show us who we are as your family in you. Lord Jesus Christ, we love you and we thank you. Cause us 
to become more like you and to share you with this world. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand. Lord, cause us to know your will and to respond to it well today. Lord, cause my words to be your words. And Lord Jesus Christ, get the glory for it. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. So again, now, so Colossians, starting actually in verse 3 and 9, and the reason is because they're, combi- they're, they're connected, right? So in verse 3, where we left off last week, so we always thank God, the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since, right, and then Paul goes into that whole kind of tangent that we talked about last week, but he starts with this prayer. He says to the church of Colossae, right, he says to those saints, those set-apart ones, he says, we always Or all the time, we're thanking God, the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. And then, verse 9, he picks it up. And so, from that day when we heard, right? And now, if you want to know what happens in that tangent, it's important you should go back and listen to it last week. But when he comes back to it, he says, okay, we're praying for you. Because of what you've done, you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you love the saints, you put your hope in him, you believe in the gospel, which is spreading all throughout the world. In fact, that same gospel was spread through Epaphras to you. And because of all those things, we thank God for you when we pray for you. Verse 9, so from the day we heard. You know, when you have someone in your life become a believer in Jesus Christ, my hope is that day is a very significant day, not just for them, but for you, for me, for us. That when people put their faith in Jesus Christ, look at what Paul says, that from the moment he heard, remember, Paul did not plant this church. Like, this is one of the unique churches that Paul did not start, Paul did not plant. In fact, we don't even know for sure if Paul had ever even been there. But because of Epaphras, because God had used this man to be faithful, Paul has heard of these things that have gone on in the church of Colossae, and he can say, I thank God. From the moment I heard about it, I thank God for you. So from the day we heard it, we have not ceased to pray for you. Now, you might think that's hyperbole, that he's saying that we haven't stopped praying for you. And and there might be some exaggeration to it, but the reality is I, I don't think there is. I think Paul earnestly prayed, not just for the churches he started, but for the churches at large. Whenever he heard about people believing in Jesus Christ, I think he prayed like crazy. Now, something that is interesting here is he says these two terms. We have not stopped praying for you, asking that you may be filled. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But he noticed those, those two different terms. Oftentimes, in our world, we just see praying as asking. Praying is our time to ask God for things. Praying is our time to, to beseech God for things, to plead to God for things. In fact, sometimes maybe your prayer life is only when bad things happen. You're scared, someone's sick, things are difficult, things are very hard. And that's when you are on your knees and you are praying like crazy for God to intervene. You're asking, you're asking, you're asking, you're asking. But when things are good, meh, you don't pray. You don't spend time with him. You don't even, certainly don't try to listen to him. And if you pray, it still vets into asking for things. And I wanted to pause there. The reason that Paul uses two terms here is because that prayer term is the same term that is often used for worship. It's that, tan- and, and he even says, it's this term for thanksgiving. That, that when we pray, we need to start with, we ought to start with thanks. That our prayer lives should start with recognizing who God is in Jesus Christ and thanking him. Thanking God for what he's done in our lives. Thanking God for what he's doing in other people's lives. Thanking God. So often we get so stuck on what we don't have instead of thanking God for what we do have. And certainly in the lives of other people, oftentimes we'll we'll want, and, and and it's a good thing, by the way, and we'll get to that in a moment. It's a good thing to want good things for other people. There's nothing wrong with that. But we oftentimes forget to just celebrate and thank God for who he is and for what he's done. We, very frankly, we forget to ground ourselves first in what it means to have a prayer of thanks. And here, specifically, Paul is saying that this is a prayer of thanksgiving for the church, for other Christians, for other believers, that he would thank God for them without stopping. 
You know, some of you know this last week, uh, my family and I, we were able to go down to the Twin Cities. I was actually uh, at a conference for all the North Central District pastors and, and many of the staffs from their church and to be on their churches. And to be surrounded, uh, we have over 170 congregations in our district, and not all of those pastors were able to make it, but be surrounded by godly men and women representing all of these churches. And by the way, actually, the, the district theme for our conference this year was loving you, the theme was actually loving our churches. That, that was the theme um, of the entire weekend together or, or the entire uh, 24 hours together. And while we were down there, just to, to have that moment to just thank God for every church represented in that room, for every pastor, for every person there. Oftentimes, again, we don't think, we certainly don't thank God for the believers, but we ought to do so. But again, here, Paul doesn't just stay with that. He says that we were, that since the day we've heard of this, since the day we've heard of your faith, we've been praying to God, thanking God, worshiping God on your behalf, and asking, asking on your behalf. Now, that question is what you, or that word is what you would think it would be. It's literally petitioning. It's asking. It's pleading. It is admitting to God something that we can't do, something that we won't do, something that is beyond our ability to do, Paul is saying, I'm asking God on your behalf that this would be done in you. Now, maybe you have struggled with prayer in your life uh, for, for several reasons. Maybe you've struggled with prayer. One primary reason is because of what I like to call the, the fatalistic approach to prayer, or the defeatist approach to prayer, right? And so this is where we take God's sovereignty and we, and we put it to this point where Scripture doesn't... <laughs> touch it at all, and we say that God is so sovereign because he's decided everything, we don't need to pray. God is God. He is all-powerful. He's going to do what he wants to do anyway, so why would I pray? Well, the answer is because he tells us to. Now, why does he tell us to? Because God, in his divine and glorious wisdom and love for us, has decided to do his will based on our prayers. Now, I say that we're based because, yes, he knows his will. He's going to do his will no matter what, and yet he wants to do his will through us, through a relationship with us. God wants us to pray because he wants us to know that he hears our prayers. God, and now you might say, well, okay, well, then if I don't pray, will God's will be destroyed? Well, of course not. God is going to do what he is going to do. That is 100% true, but he wants you. He wants you to be involved. He wants your prayers. He desires your heart to know him and be known by him. He wants the relationship that comes through prayer. And so because of that, God desires for us to pray into reality what he has already decreed and decided to do. Join with him. The things that he wants to do, pray with him to do. The things that he has planned to do, pray for him to do. And you will see the Lord do miraculous things because he has already decided and desires to do it. He just wants you to be involved in it. Pray. Pray and ask. So here, what does Paul ask? What does he plead? What is, he, he take all of the things. Now notice, he doesn't grab prayer requests. Right? He, he doesn't ask the Colossians first, hey, what are all the things I can pray you for? Well, you know, what are the certain situations? That sort of stuff? What? No, no, no. He has a prayer that he has set in his mind because he knows exactly what he desires for God to do in the lives of these people. You know, so oftentimes our prayers are so circumstantial. They're just based on stuff on everything around us. And the problem is, again, so things are good, we don't pray. If things are bad, then we pray a lot. And then if we pray when things are bad and they don't become good, we think God doesn't like us or God hates us or he's far from us. And it gets into this whole weird circumstantial way that we view God when reality is God just wants a relationship with us based on who he is always. Right? We've talked about this, that it's not based on circumstances. Our relationship with him isn't based on circumstances. Our relationship with him is based on truth and reality beyond circumstances. So we ask. Paul asks, and he asks to God that the church of Colossae would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. 
How many of you have, and you don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you have ever, want, have ever wanted to know God's will for your life? I think all of us, <laughs> if you give your life to Jesus, obviously you want to know what God wants for your life. That's one of the things, especially if you're 16, 17, 18, 19, you know, that, that kind of that late uh, teenage, early 20s time in your life when like, you know, like you're making decisions that will affect the rest of your life. But even if you're older, you know you want to do what God wants you to do. So you're asking constantly sometimes, God, what do you want for my life? What do you want me to do for my life? And then sometimes we're doing these, these whole weird like fleece things where we're like doing these tests and we're putting all these tests before God. We're saying, God, if I see this sign, if I do this and this is your will, if this happens and this is not your will. And, and we get all stuck in, the, in this whole weird kind of like tricks and signs, which by the way is like borderline magic, right? That none of that is what God desires. He desires a relationship where you know him and trust him and already do know his will. Right? Jesus says that the sheep will know my voice. And so what is God's will for you? Well, first of all, he is the one who provides it. That's why Paul asks for it. Paul here asks for the church that they would be filled with the knowledge. The word there literally means, as, as uh, one commentator puts it, literally means to be characterized by. That, that we would be filled with the knowledge. That we would be characterized by the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. You want to know God's will for your life, know God. Have people pray for you to know his will. Literally, if you want to know God's will for your life, ask people, say, you know what, I am just, I don't know what God wants for me in this. And yes, you know, sometimes they're very circumstantial. Sometimes it is the, the, the little thing. Sometimes, it, though it might feel big for us, sometimes it is, do I quit this job? Do I go to another job? Do I go here? Do I go here? Do I send my kids here? Do I do this? Do I do that? Do we do it? You know, and, and our life is filled with those decisions. And we want God's will in those things. But sometimes we forget that because of who we are in Christ, his will and desire should be so outworking in us that we are doing his will without sometimes always even thinking of it. That because of our relationship with him, because we're so filled with his spiritual wisdom and understanding, that we are able to do his will as we just seek him more. You want to be filled with the knowledge of his will? Ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. Ask him, say, Lord, and have others pray for you. Have the church pray for you. Know this, that this is my desire, is to pray for you these things, that we as the elders, we want to pray this for you, just as Paul did, that you all would be filled with the knowledge of his will. And all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now again, what's fascinating too about those two terms together, they're similar but different. The spiritual wisdom, and I believe, I believe spiritual, by the way, covers both. They just translations didn't want to make it redundant. Right? So it's spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding. And I say that to say that both of these things are in the spirit realms. Right? First, wisdom. How do you operate in life? How do you do what you should do in certain situations? Understanding is literally the word like intellect, intelligence. If you will, this is street smart, book smart, both in the spirit. How do we know what God wants us to do in the day-to-day -day street life? How do we know what God desires from us in his word, in his scriptures, in study? Well, they both come from him filling us, him giving us that knowledge. We cannot know God. You cannot know God unless God reveals himself to you. So pray, ask God to increase, to fill you with his knowledge of his will. And by the way, be encouraged that as you get closer to God, you will know his will. You might not always know it perfectly. You might not always know it succinctly, but there will be a peace and there will be a weightiness in your heart that you know God is in it. And more importantly, sometimes you know when he's not in it. So you know when you're directly not doing what he's told you to do. And why? Why would Paul ask for this? Why would Paul pray for this? Of all the things that he could ask for, he could ask for wealth, he could ask for health, he could ask for all these things for the church in Colossae. He could ask for the destruction of Rome. He could ask for so much. Why would he ask of all the things that they would be filled with the knowledge of the will of God? So that, verse 10, because from that, 
From that knowledge, right, both wisdom and understanding, right, both street smart and book smart, from that, from that wisdom and that intelligence, from those two things in us of who God is, verse 10, so that we can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Paul's great desire is that the people of God would not know God only within, but that through from within they would have that distinctive, that they would walk. That word walk literally means to live a life. That they would conduct their lives in a manner, what? In a manner worthy. In a manner worthy of the Lord. And that, and that by the way, notice this is not just worthy of the Lord. God is an angry God who wants you to do this, 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 this. He's going to get mad if you don't do that. that, that. No, no. Look at the, the heart here. It's actually to please God. It has nothing to do with God being angry and God being a judge and God sending you to hell. and none of, none of that here. This is not some morality of trying to do good things and be a good person and then you get into heaven. No, no. This is walking in a manner worthy. Why? Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Now, your heart's intention is to make the God of your life smile. That he would be so enamored because of, your, because of who you are, because of his child. And he would say, look at my little ones. Look at who they are. That we would please God. Not in some moralistic, judgmental sense, but in an intimacy, in a love. Because we love him and he loves us. That he loved us first. And so we love him in return and he loves us all the more. That we make the one we love smile. That you would walk in a way that makes God pleased. And when you do that, and how do you do that? Well, you do that by being filled with the knowledge of his will. And here now, by the way, most scholars point out, and your translation probably does this, there's this fancy thing called the colon, right? Where it makes it into a list. So he says, being filled with the knowledge of, the, of God, being filled with the knowledge of him, walking in a manner that's worthy to, to make him smile, to please him, to give him pleasure. And then there's a list of participles, that is action verbs happening, that you will ultimately do God's will in these things. Now, of course, you can do these things hollow. That's why it starts with knowing the will of God in your life, in street smarts, and spiritual wisdom, and in understanding, right? That you would know God in both ways. If you don't know his scriptures, you're not going to know. If you don't know the intelligence of God, if you don't know his theology, if you don't know those things about God, it's going to be really hard to be street smart for God. And if you don't know how to be street smart for God, if you don't know how to be wise, you could have all the right things up here and be totally far from him, right? It's the both together, that you would know God intellectually, that you would know his word, you would know his scriptures, you would know all about him, but that you would also know him in life and in wisdom and how to operate, that those together cause you to walk worthy, give him pleasure. And what are the things that happen from that, from that life? What are the distinctives? What makes your family known that you are a Jesus one, a Christ one, a Christian? Well, first, bearing fruit in every good work. And I could say, period. The, one of the speakers this weekend um, would use the phrase full stop. And I, I, I might end up using that a lot. I apologize, right? So, so he says, uh, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work. And you would do good things. And, and the word there is literally work. It is labor. Remember, by the way, this, this might be a shock to you. Um, work did not happen at the fall of man. Work was given pre-fall, right? That in the Garden of Eden, God had given Adam work, given Adam and Eve responsibilities, work to do before Satan destroyed it, right? Before the fall. Now, now the fall made work toilsome and difficult and hard and backbreaking, but redeemed work in God just simply puts work back into the perspective of what God made it to be. God's desire is not that we all have vacations for the rest of our lives. God's desire is that we have and will do the good works he has planned for us to do. And that when we do them, we'll bear fruit. Number one, that when you do the things that God has called you to do, this means, of course, literally actions, things for living faithfully for him, but also just means your job. That when you would work for God, and we're going to see this later in Colossians, that when you do what you do 
for him that people would know that why you're living your life, everything that you're doing, whether you're in ministry or whether you're a teacher or whether you're a contractor, that everything that you do would be to bear fruit. And that maybe, yes, certainly maybe you have the Jesus talk, but maybe you don't. Maybe you are just simply you. You know, when I was uh, working at Walmart through seminary, uh, this was one of my great desires every day, that when I would go, that people would know who Christ is, because sometimes I'd be able to have those conversations while we're stocking vegetables, and sometimes I wouldn't. Sometimes on my lunch break, I wouldn't have time to sit and chat with people. I would have to be reading books through seminary. I'd have to be doing Hebrew. And I would just pray and say, God, I pray that even though I can't talk with people right now, even though I don't have that time right now, Lord, that you would use me to show who you are, that my work here would bear fruit. Secondly, increasing in the knowledge of God. And notice this this spiral here that you would be filled with the knowledge so that you would work in a manner or that you would walk in a manner worthy of him and you would bear good fruit and that you would increase in knowledge, right? It's this spiral that continues up that we would know God, work for God, bear fruit, know him more, work for him. There's this beautiful spiral that they increase. They they increase into each other. That as you're filled with the knowledge of God, walking in a manner worthy of him, You are bearing fruit in what you do, and as you do that, you are increasing in your knowledge of him. The more that we live for the Lord, the more that we will know how to live for the Lord. Thirdly, that you will be strengthened, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Now that phrase, by the way, that's, so, so Paul does this, this fascinating thing where he uses this play on words and he says that you would be empowered with power, that you would be strengthened with strength, that you would be enabled with enablement, basically. It, it's this way that he's saying that you would be empowered with power, all power, all power, that you would be empowered with all power power that you remember you might know this of your study of God in theology God is omnipotent he's all powerful God has all potential and here Paul is saying that that his desire that when you're walking in a manner worthy one of those distinctives is that you would be powerful that you would be strengthened with all power that you would be empowered with all power according to what according to his glorious might According to the, the might of his glory, and to, according to who God is in his divine wonder. Remember, we're talking about God, the creator of the heavens and earth. God, who is beyond time itself. God, who is above anything we could comprehend. That that power would exist in you. Not to necessarily do miracles, not necessarily to right the evils of the world, not necessarily to do, uh, you know, magic by any means. No, 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 no. Notice... What is, what is that power supposed to do in you? It's supposed to give you endurance and patience with joy. Now, it's funny because oftentimes in Christianity, we want the power things. We say, well, God, someone's sick and I want to have power to heal them. God, something's wrong and I want to have the power to do something. God, something but instead, no, no, no. God, the power God is giving you is to endure. That means not taking the bad things away. That means enduring through the bad things. Why? Because that's the power of Christ. That's who he is, that we would endure. And then that we have patience. Have you ever prayed for, pray, for patience? Did you ever know that patience is a strength thing? You need to have power from God to be patient. We need to have power from the almighty one, the all-powerful one, the omnipotent one, to wait. Waiting is hard. And if you're in a season of waiting for something in your life, it is difficult. We get it. I understand it. And the Lord's not going to instantly fix it. But he will give you power to endure it. And joy. That you would have joy in the patient endurance. Forbearance is the word through the things that he has planned. Finally, he says, giving thanks. It's the last of this list here. That we would walk in a worthy manner. Bearing fruit, increasing in knowledge, being strengthened, giving thanks. Giving thanks to the Father. Remember, so Paul has been giving thanks, but now his desire is they would be giving thanks. Are you known for being thankful, or do you complain a lot? Are you bitter a lot? 
Do you, do you look on the downside a lot? Or are you thankful for what God has given you? Is your life defined? When people look at your life, do they see contentment or discontentment? Because contentment is a life of gratefulness, that you are thankful to God, the Father. And look at here now in verses 12 through 14. Paul actually gets to, to kind of the undergirding principle that, that is the source, is the wellspring of all of this. And he, he gets there with thanksgiving. It says that you're giving thanks to the Father. And, and why? Because of what the Father has done. And he's done several things here. Look at the verse 12 to begin. First, the Father has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints and the light. Now again, that's a fancy way to put it all, so I'm going to try to break it down. He simply says this, that God has made you worthy. Right? We just talked about Paul's prayer is that God would fill you, characterize you with all knowledge, that God would do that, and that because God does that, that you would walk worthy of him in all these things, that you would walk worthy of that name, But he's the one who ultimately made you worthy in the first place. Notice that it's not about you. This is all what God has done in the lives of his redeemed so that we would thank him and praise him. It's not us. It's him. He has qualified you. He's made you worthy. That's not something you've done. You haven't earned it. You haven't uh, checked the marks. You haven't been good enough. None of us are good enough. You, God has said, are worthy because he decided to he has qualified you and to do what to share in the inheritance to be shareholders to take part in the portion and the portion of what of the saints of the light those set apart to live light in this dark world that you would have a part of that that you would be a shareholder of light. god is the one who's done it and notice, by the way, this is all, none of this is like, do this, be a good person. No, this is, the, this is what God has done in you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, this is his will for you. This is what he's done and what he is doing in you together as a church. This isn't just you, it's us all together. God is filling us, not just you, us with his knowledge, making us worthy to walk in a manner to worthy of him. He's making us bear fruit. He's making us increase in knowledge. He's making us be strengthened in the power to endure. He's making us to give thanks because he's qualified us to be shareholders in the light. How? Well, verse 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. That first word, he delivered us. That word literally is rescued. He rescued you. He rescued me. That God, through his son, Jesus Christ, rescued us. That's how he qualified us. Maybe your life feels very far from being rescued. Maybe your life is in the middle of the pit. Maybe what you need right now, more than anything, visibly is a savior. His name is Jesus Christ, and God has given him to you and to me and to us who believe. So believe in him. Give him your life. You might not figure out how it's going to do it. You, know, you know, might not know all, everything perfectly. That's the whole point here. Paul is praying that we would increase in those things after you believe. Believe in him, and you will be saved. Give your life to Jesus. You don't have to have all the answers. Give your life to him, and when you do, he rescues you. For he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. That's actually the imagery that we have for this series of this being moved from a side of darkness to the side of light. This is kind of where that imagery comes from. That when you have given your life to Jesus Christ, when you've given your life to God through him, he rescued you from the domain of darkness. The word there, domain, literally means from the authority Remember, the, it says in the book of Ephesians that our war, our battle, is not against the principalities of this world. It's not against flesh and blood, but it's against the principalities, the authorities, the powers of the spiritual realm. There's a spiritual war, and in that spiritual war, Satan has been given authority over the darkness, over this dark realm. And when you are a non-believer, you are under his control, whether you know it or not. And Jesus has rescued you. That you don't have to do 
what the enemy wants you to do anymore. You have been rescued. You have been freed. In fact, actually, again, it says that you have been rescued from the authority of darkness. Darkness over your life, consuming your life, manipulating your life. You've been freed from it. Now, that doesn't mean as Christians we won't be depressed. It doesn't mean that we won't be sad. In fact, actually, Paul himself went through bouts where he wanted nothing more than to just die and gain everything by being with Jesus, right? That doesn't mean that being a Christian doesn't mean that you don't get sad. No, 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 by no means. What it means is that the darkness doesn't control you. The enemy doesn't control you. Satan, the things against God, no longer controls you. Instead, you are transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son, the kingdom of love and light, the kingdom of bearing fruit and endurance, increasing the knowledge, giving thanks. The, the, the distinctive of your family would no longer be, the distinctive of your life would no longer be being manipulated and controlled by darkness, but by being free to live in the kingdom of light. Notice, by the way, here, there's no middle ground. There's no in-between. There's no neutral zone or territory. You're either in the kingdom of the beloved son or you're not. You're either in the light or in the darkness. There's no, like, dusk. Right? There's, there's no middle here. You are either for the king and with him or you are far from him and enslaved away from him. In fact, actually, the scriptures say that you will be a slave to someone. The question is, will you be a slave to righteousness and life or will you be a slave to death? and destruction in your life. But he, Christ, God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, this is done. It's happened. This is the reality. So too often, we are peasants, we act like peasants when we're princes, right? We, we, we act like we have nothing, but we have been given everything, he has given you everything in Jesus. And of most of which, verse 14, in whom we have redemption. That word redemption, I wanted to pause there because it's he who have, we have been given a ransom. So, so the word here actually in Colossians, there's a lot of this language of like commercial language, buying language. And the redemption language, this word, literally means that we were in debt and someone paid our debt, right? They redeemed the debt. And that is what Jesus Christ did. He became sin, who knew no sin. He who had no sins to be forgiven, ransomed himself. He paid the ransom money. He paid the ransom fee by his own blood and life. That's what we just celebrated here at Easter, at Good Friday, that Jesus Christ ransomed himself, the king, for you. In him, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Remember, the forgiveness of your sins did not come just by God deciding, oh, you know what, I'll just let it all pass. No, the forgiveness of sins came by your debt being paid, as it says in Romans, so that God could be both just and justifier. It wasn't that God just gave away your sins and said, oh, no problem, forget about it. No, 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 real offense happened. Real offense needed to be paid, and Jesus paid it. It actually is a great principle. When you are seeking to forgive someone, you need to admit in your heart that they have wounded you. They have taken something from you. Something wrong has been done. I would urge you, don't just say, oh, that's fine. Oh, that's okay. Oh, don't worry about it. No, own it, and then say, I forgive you. I own the pain that you caused me. I own the wound that you've done, but I can forgive you because I caused pain to God. I caused a wound in him that was eternal. I caused a pain and a suffering in him, and he ransomed himself to save me from the cost of it. He paid it to forgive me. I can forgive you for what you've done against me. See, forgiveness is not just some throwaway thing. Say, ah, it's no big deal. No, it's a huge deal. But it's because the price has been paid that we can be forgiven and we can forgive. As you may know here in Colossians, that becomes a theme, of course, later on. That we have been forgiven first because we have been rescued and ransomed together. 
Again, look at all this. All put it together. That we are shareholders together. This is not one singular person. Paul, Paul's prayer here has already been for the set apart ones, right? He says, I'm writing this whole letter to the set apart ones, those who will be different, those who will be distinct. Here in our church, there will be distinct people who stand out, set apart ones, uh, hopefully it would be all of us, but that we would stand out as a community in Jesus Christ as shareholders in the light. Because he has rescued us, he has ransomed us for the forgiveness of our sins, and he fills us with all spiritual wisdom and understanding that we would walk in a manner worthy of him. Because he's the one who made us worthy in the first place. So, as shareholders, first of all, I should ask, even before these questions, do you believe you're a shareholder in the light of Jesus Christ? That you actually hold part of the kingdom in your life. He has given it to you. Why God would use the church instead of just miraculously revealing himself to the world, we don't know. Again, this probably has something to do with that whole relationship thing, right? That God wants you. Just like your prayers, he wants your life. He wants to be involved with you. So he's made you, made us, shareholders. So as shareholders in the light of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, first of all, are you praying? Are you praying? You're a shareholder in the light of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Do you ask God? Do you thank God? Do you thank God for what he's done? And do you thank God for what he's doing in other people's lives? Do you thank God for the gospel going to the ends of the earth? Do you thank God for, for the things like in our city, what this partnership between churches we have, things like Lighthouse, things like Youth for Christ, things like New Beginnings, all these partnerships that we have in this church, uh, all the partnerships we have in this city, things like this mission trip that just went where more than half of the people on the trip weren't even from this building or this body, but they were from other churches here in the community and actually throughout the state. Are you thanking God? for what he's doing. And do you ask him to fill other people up, not just you, but others up? Do you pray for your family that they would be filled with the knowledge of the will of God and all spiritual wisdom and understanding? Do you pray for, I'll just say it, your pastor, your elders, your leaders, or do you just criticize them? They're not there. Same with us. Do we pray for you or do we just criticize you? That would be wrong. Pray for each other. Love each other in all wisdom and understanding. Pray if you think someone is totally off. Pray that they would be filled with wisdom and understanding and the knowledge of God. And pray, that, and Lord, maybe I'm the one who's wrong. Maybe I need to be filled with wisdom here. Pray for yourself in that as well. But do you? Do we thank him? Do we pray? Secondly, as shareholders, do you seek to know and live for God? Remember these good works that increase in the knowledge. Do you seek to know and live for him by bearing fruit, increasing, being strengthened, and giving thanks. As a shareholder, are those the distinctives? That people look at your life and they say, wow, that person is so enduring. That person is so content. Wow, that person is just filled with good works, goodness. They just do good things. Wow, that person knows so much about who God is? Or do people look at you and see none of those things in your life? Finally, are you remembering and are you identified by what God has done for you? Remember, all of this is what God has done for us. None of this is us. It's all just responding to what he's done first. Again, some of you have, have heard me mention, I've already talked about, and we're going to be updating it soon here on the website, of our values, of our church. Two of the first key values that God has revealed himself, God value, we value that God reveals who he is, but we value our response. He's done it first, so respond to what he's done. Do you? Do you remember? Do you reflect? Do you look to him and give him thanks? Let's pray. So God, we do thank you right now for ransoming us, for paying the price we couldn't pay for rescuing us from things that we didn't even know we were a part of, from rescuing us from this domain of darkness in our life and transferring us to the kingdom of light. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, and my prayer this morning is that you would fill all of us with the knowledge of your will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, that you would cause us 
to walk in a manner that is worthy of you. And that people would see our lives and know you. That our distinctives wouldn't just be our family name, wouldn't it be our last names, wouldn't even be that we're from northern Minnesota, but our distinctives would be that we are Christ ones first. And because of what you've done for us, Jesus, that it defines everything we are and what we do. And Lord, first of all, we love you. And we thank you for loving us first. It's your name that we pray, Jesus Christ. Thank you this morning for speaking. Cause us to respond. Amen.
Give thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. If you'd like prayer here after the service, I invite you to come up. I'd love to pray with you. Elders, ministry leaders, we'd love to pray with you. But now please receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord ever turn his countenance upon you and give you his peace. May the Lord fill you with the knowledge of his will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding that you may walk in a manner worthy, giving him pleasure. And may you bear fruit in every good work. May you increase in the knowledge of him always and further. May you be strengthened in all power to endure in forbearance and patience. May you give him thanks as children, shareholders of the light. And may the world know him because of the distinctives found in you as a part of his family. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Amen.